Peace and blessings. Welcome back to the channel once again, where we talk all things health and healing from a holistic perspective, and today will be no different. Today, we're going to talk about five foods that can help you start to increase burning fat in your body. And those foods work in different ways, so I'll jump into that a little bit later. But what's really important to know and understand about this topic is that it is by far one of the most searched topics on YouTube, Google, and any other search engine for that matter. And the reason why it is, is because today, especially in America, 75% of the population is either overweight or obese. So if there are 100 people in the room, 75 of them are either overweight or obese. 1,750 are either overweight and or obese. That means that only one quarter, 25% of the population is actually at a healthy weight. Now, albeit there are some, you know, outstanding factors like, for instance, um, myself, I'm 6'2", and I'm around about 218 pounds. Now, according to the whole BMI, I'm actually overweight. But what the BMI doesn't account for is the composition of muscle to fat. So that is one part of it. But for the large majorities uh, of that 75%, most people are actually overweight in the sense of too much fat in the body or obese, considering that their BMI is greater than 31. So they have a much higher percentage of body fat. And those are the people I'm concerned about. Okay. Now we're if you start to think about us like 300 years ago, 200 years ago, when you saw somebody who was overweight or had excess body fat on them, it was a sign of opulence. Because back in the days, when you looked at somebody who had, who had the ability to put extra weight on their body, it was a sign that this person had abundance. This person had money. They had access to good food. You know, so, but things have changed so much because our food has changed so much. Our access to food has changed so much. And as a result, our food itself has changed so much too. It's become industrialized. And this is why it's not only making us more obese, but it's unfortunately making us so much more unhealthy as well too. And so what we're going to talk about today is going to help you understand how to stop making all the fat and start burning it. Okay. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll have at least you know, a little bit of guidance on how to start that journey for you. But before we get into the foods and things of that nature, I want to talk first about the different types of fat, um, fat based on location in the body. And then I'll talk a little bit about one of the big causes of why we're triggering our body to produce so much fat. So let's start first start with the types of fat. You have two different types of fat, primarily white and brown fat. OK, now the predominant fat in our bodies is going to be white fat. That white fat stores energy in the body in various places because that's what fat usually is made for. You know, we store fat because the body is saying, hey, I got this excess calories. I don't know what to do with it. But just in case there's a famine or food runs out, I want to make sure I have some for later. And so I'm going to just tuck this away in the form of fat. And whenever you're ready, whenever it's a time where you don't have food, we can burn that up. OK, so that's that white fat. Also, what's stored in that fat is very important, too, because most people don't know and understand is that that fat in your body is storing things in it. It's like a storehouse. Just think of it like a deep freezer. OK, now this deep freezer is also producing things inside of it, too. It's producing hormones. OK, it's producing different type of um, biological chemicals, enzymes as well, too. OK, hormones like leptin and adiponectin. OK, leptin is the, the hormone that tells us, hey, you're full. Stop eating. OK, so, so for somebody who has an imbalance in their body, they won't have a lot, a lot of leptin. And so they will overeat. OK. Also, you have brown fat. Brown fat is called the thermogenic fat. And here's why. Brown fat burns energy and burns calorie by increasing heat in the body. OK, brown fat is the fat in our bodies that when we're out in the cold and we get start to shiver, brown fat starts to create heat. OK, to prevent us from being too cold. So that's the good side of brown fat. The other side of uh, brown fat is that the more brown fat you have in your body, it tends to mean that you are leaner. OK, which is, you know, 
counterintuitive to what we typically think around fat is that fat usually add fat to your body, but actually brown fat, the more brown fat you have, it tends to show and has been proven that people with more brown fat tend to be more leaner. Okay, so in another video, maybe I'll talk about how do you increase the brown fat in your body to be leaner. It also has been shown that people who have more brown fat are actually healthier too, okay? The other really important thing about brown fat as well is that brown fat improves your metabolism, okay? Which is hugely important when it comes to not only burning fat, but also your blood pressure, also protecting you from diabetes, and also decreasing your risk for coronary artery disease as well too. So those are your two primary fats. You have white fat and then you have brown fat. Now here's the thing. Based on where that fat is in the body, it will behave differently, okay? Even based on the composition, okay? But depending on where that fat is in the body will determine uh, what that fat does to you and for you, okay? So we have two uh, primary types of uh, fat or where they're located that we'll talk about today. So you have visceral fat and visceral fat is the dangerous fat. Okay. And why? Because the visceral fat is the fat that is stored deep in the belly and it's surrounding the organs. Okay. And it particularly impacts the liver specifically. And the reason why is because that type of fat, it not only pushes and squeezes and puts pressure on the other organs, but it also is linked to heart disease, it's also linked to cancer, it's linked to asthma, and also dementia as well too. So that's visceral fat. Visceral fat is the fat that you find in the abdomen area, okay? So that type of fat also is important because when the blood leaves the visceral fat, whatever is in that type of fat goes to out to the body, specifically the liver, okay? So if you're eating a lot of processed foods, all of those food chemicals go straight to the liver, okay? If you're eating a lot of fat, all of that fat goes straight to the liver. If you're eating a lot of sugar, that goes straight to the liver. If it starts to produce certain hormones, that goes straight to the liver, okay? Also, uh, certain pro-inflammatory uh, chemicals go straight to the liver. So what is that gonna do to the liver? It's gonna make the liver fatty. It's gonna make the liver inflamed okay and make the liver toxic as well too okay and that's really important i'll talk about that in just a second why that's so important okay so yeah visceral fat the type of fat that is in the belly region okay so that's hugely important that is the most dangerous type of fat as a matter of fact a lot of um studies have shown that we can measure the circumference of your your waistline or your belly and that's the circumference of your belly as it grows, your health goes down, okay? As it shrinks, your health goes up, okay? And what you have to think about is this is where all of the vital organs are located, okay? So I, I talked earlier about the difference between white fat and brown fat. Those type of fats are gonna be in different locations too. The white fat is gonna be uh, located primarily in the chest, the belly, the legs, okay? That brown fat that we we need more of because it makes us leaner and healthier. It's going to be in the upper chest, the neck, the shoulders, and also the stomach area. Okay, so the more of that we have. So again, depending on that location of where that fat is will tell you the story on how, what it does to your body as well too. All right, so again, getting back to the visceral fat. That is by far the fat that is in this abdomen area that is by far the most dangerous type of fat. So if you had the type, if you stand up and you look straight down, you cannot see your toes because your belly is protruding, that's telling you we got to do something about that. And we got to get very active in doing something about that. Of course, that starts with nutrition, but it's going to also start with a few things that I'll talk about in a second here. Okay. But we got to address this visceral fat because it's putting so much pressure. It's impacting our organs physically. Okay, because the more we have of this fat, the more pressure. It's like, you know, being in a crowd of people and only having elbow room and you're getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Okay, just imagine that. As the kidneys get tighter and tighter and tighter, they, don't, they can't function the way they need to. As the bowels become more and more impacted, they can't function the, the way that they need to. On top of that, and this is really important, 
fat is like a magnet for toxicity. As a matter of fact, most of the toxicity in your body, most people think it's in the liver. Most of that toxicity is actually in your fat. It is absolutely the perfect place to store fat because now you're taking the toxicity out of an organ and now you're putting it into the fat, okay? And the idea is whenever you burn that fat, those toxins come out and hopefully the elimination channels are open. But as you guys know, that's part of what my detox does. It opens those elimin elimination channels which have been shut down because of the accumulation of toxins, because of the bowels have been backed up, because the now skin is not as profuse or you know, open as it should be, okay? And so now you start to have skin issues, okay? Because the kidneys aren't performing like they need to, and now you're not getting toxins out through the kidney via the, um, the urine, okay? So once those elimination pathways become clogged up, now you can't eliminate. Okay, and if you can't eliminate, you can't get rid of toxins, the body has to figure out what to do with them. And a lot of those toxins will be stored inside of the fat, okay? This is also why, if you check out another video that I've done, this is also why it becomes so difficult to burn fat because when you burn the fat and it essentially melts away and then those toxins spill out into the system, now you can become septic. Now those toxins can do damage on the organs inside of the blood vessels. That's a big issue when you do not have those elimination channels open, okay? So hold that tight for a second. You got visceral fat. Now you have subcutaneous fat, which is the fat literally right under your skin, okay? So this fat that you see here, literally right here under my skin, that's the subcutaneous fat. Or if you can reach down and pinch something off of your belly, that belly fat, that's also subcutaneous fat as well too. Now that subcutaneous fat is the most plentiful of the fat in the body. And here's the thing about subcutaneous fat. Subcutaneous fat causes more fatty acids to be produced in the body, which increases the amount of insulin. Now here's where we're getting into the important part of what I'm trying to help you guys understand. The more fatty acids you have, you're gonna increase the amount of insulin. Insulin is a fat storage hormone. Now when I say hormone, what I want you to think of is anything that tells the body what to do, okay? A hormone is simply a chemical messenger that tells the body what to do. It's a, it, it literally sends a message and says, okay, you do this. Okay, now you do this. And now you do this, okay? Now that hormone in this case is insulin. And insulin tells the body to store fat. The higher the insulin, the more insulin you produce in your body, it will tell your body to store fat. Now, here's why that's so important, because this is one of the big things, especially now and today. We are living in one of the most stressful times ever, which is odd, because when you think about our ancestors who had to run from lions, tigers, and bears, and fight for the food and not know where it's coming from and couldn't go to a supermarket, you know, the necessities of in life are really the most important things. And those are the things that we should be the most stressed about. But when you start to think about our access to food today, like we don't have a problem with access to food today. I mean, you can go in the store and get something for a dollar. You can, you know, you know, whatever it may be. Like there's times where you, you literally had no access to food. Like if you didn't make it, you didn't catch it, you didn't eat, okay? Today we have access to food. We can literally just walk into a store and buy something, okay? Now I'm not saying you can't buy something of quality for a dollar because, you know, the way that things have changed today, they've made, they made all of the, the trash food affordable and they made all the good food unaffordable. And you know, that's a whole nother conversation in terms of value, and I'll talk about that another time, but it's important for us to know and understand that stress today isn't what the stress was yesterday. And what I mean by that is, what we stress about today is like somebody made a comment on our Instagram, okay? We stress today about traffic. We stress today about 
you know, somebody said something about me and gossip. These weren't things that our ancestors stressed about, okay? And so it's so important that now we're having stress triggers from in ways that we've never even had for the last 100,000 years as human beings. And as a result of that, we're constantly in a state of stress as opposed to being in short, acute bouts of stress, meaning, hey, I don't know what I'm going to eat today. I really need to figure that out. I go out, I figure it out. Now I don't have to stress anymore. Okay. Now we're being constantly stressed throughout the day. We look at the news, stressful. We listen to music, most of the music, stressful. Okay. We go out, go out in, in our cars and we're worried about getting in an accident or getting pulled over or whatever it may be. Stress. Okay. So there's so many ways that we're being stressed today that we weren't stressed before. And so because of this, a lot of this is causing physiological triggers, specifically a physiological stress response in our bodies that we're not even aware of. And what I mean by that is this, whenever you get stressed, it's important that you know and understand that the body doesn't know the difference between a true stress and a emotional or mental stress. Let me give you the, the difference between the two. A true stress is somebody has a gun pointed to your head and they're threatening to kill you. That's a true stress. A true stress, if you're, you're taking a walk through the park and out of the blue, a jaguar jumps out at you and is trying to eat you for dinner. That is a true stress, okay? But when you have a stress, like somebody cut you off in traffic, that's not a true stress, okay? Now, it may be something that you don't like, but it's not a true stress. Your life is not in danger, okay? And as a result, because we're getting stress, what we believe to be stress, our bodies don't know the difference between, you know, a jaguar or a gun being pointed at you or somebody saying a rude comment to you on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube. Okay, your body doesn't know the difference. So if you choose a stress response and you choose to stay in a constant stressful state, it is going to produce certain hormones. Okay, so like I'll give you instances. Whenever you're in a stress state, your body changes to help you get out of that stress state because again, your body can't see what's going on on the outside. So if you tell your body it's stress by saying, hey, this person said something crazy to me, now I'm on uh, Instagram, now I feel stressed, now I'm upset, your body is going to think you're running from a bear. And so it's going to produce the same stress hormones, okay? Cortisol, adrenaline, etc. that it would be if you were running from a bear, okay? Now that's cool if you're running from a bear, but it's not cool if you just had a comment or something like that. And the reason why is because those hormones are literally being created in your body to get you out of that situation, to get you in fight or flight, okay? To get you into fight or flight, you know, status. What you'll notice is when you go into fight or flight because you're in a stressful state, the pupils dilate so you can see more. The heart rate increases so you can get blood pumping, okay? Get your energy up. Adrenaline goes out into the body to create energy, okay? to be pumped to the muscles. Now your muscles get tense. They're ready to run. They're ready to fight if you're ready for that, okay? Now imagine, that's good if you need to run for, from a bear and get away from them for about two to three minutes. But if your body is constantly in that stressful state, constantly producing cortisol, constantly producing adrenaline, constantly raising your heartbeat, constantly dilating your pupils, at some point, because you're in that chronic state, it's going to ruin your eyes. It's going to ruin your heart, okay? And it's going to ruin your body physiologically with all of those hormones because stress hormones are acidic and toxic to the body when they're produced on such a chronic basis, on a long-term basis, okay? And one of those particular hormones that is damaging to the body is cortisol. So when you stress, you produce cortisol, okay? Now, here's the thing about cortisol that most people don't know. As you increase cortisol, it turns your proteins into sugar, okay? It turns your proteins into sugar. That sugar that is made by your liver, okay? 
sugar, not the, not necessarily the sugar that you eat, but the sugar that you made that is made by your liver. And that sugar will eventually be converted into fat. Okay, so I'm going to go through that one more time. You stress and you're in a chronic state of stress. You will create cortisol, which is a stress hormone. If you're chronically producing cortisol, your proteins will be converted into sugar. Okay, sugar is often converted into fat. Now, here's the thing. As your blood sugar levels raise, it's going to increase insulin. Remember what I said about insulin. Insulin is a fat storage hormone. It tells the body, store fat, okay? Because this cortisol level is so high, it's going to produce insulin by way of converting proteins into sugar, which raises insulin levels. Now, why is that important? Again, insulin tells the body to store fat. Insulin makes belly fat even when you're not eating sugar. So you will have somebody who's actually trying to eat better, you know, who's exercising and who still can't uh, lose weight or burn fat because they're chronically stressed. OK, so it's important that you know and understand that sometimes it's not just about what you eat or how you exercise. It's also also about your stress level, too. So that's one of the questions I'm always asking people I work with. What is your stress level? And I even have to go deeper because some people are so unaware of their stress level that they can't even figure out that they actually stress. So initially when I ask them, they'll say maybe a two or three, but, but by the time I ask them maybe four or five more questions of, and help them understand what stress is, now they're up to an eight or a nine. Okay, so it's so important for that reason. And it's also important to understand it for this uh, reason as well too. As I said before, cortisol is a stress hormone and specifically is more like a steroid. Okay. So if you're, I'll give you an, an example for somebody who takes a lot of steroids, either for pain or maybe they have an autoimmune condition, etc. If you're taking a uh, like a, a steroid, like prednisone, it will cause you to gain weight. You'll notice that this is really no different. Okay, once your your body starts producing these steroid-like hormones in the body, it will tell your body to gain weight, to store fat, and you will not be able to get it off. So hugely important. We have that understanding before we move forward with the five foods, because if you don't understand that, these five foods will not help you. Okay. I have to tell you that because I think a lot of people do videos and they'll tell you the five foods, but they don't give you the understanding to help you understand that when you eat these five foods and why it doesn't work. Okay. So you have to address other things as well too. But without any further ado, let's get to those five foods that could help you. And I'm going to explain why, how they work in terms of helping you lose weight and burn fat. All right. Number one, avocados. One of my favorite by far, avocados are definitely one of my favorite foods to actually burn fat, which is crazy because when you eat avocados, the first thing you think is healthy fats. That's why you actually eat av avocados, okay? That's why you can actually get avocado oil out of, out of avocados because it has natural healthy fats in it, okay? So it, it seems like it doesn't, it contrasts. I put fat into my body and then I lose fat. Well, you have to understand that when you eat an avocado, you're just not eating healthy fat. An avocado has lots of great things in it. One of those things being something called avo avocotton, okay? Avocotton B, okay? Avocotton B is the thing that protects you against lipotoxicity. And what is lipotoxicity? Lipotoxicity is when there's an overaccumulation of fat inside of the cell. Okay, so avocado B actually protects you from that. It also helps with insulin levels as well, too. It makes you more sensitive to insulin instead of insulin resistant. So as you become more sensitive to insulin, your insulin becomes more effective. Okay, and that all comes from just eating avocados because they have that compound in it known as avocado B. Okay, so avocados. I eat avocados all the time. I didn't know this about avocados before I started eating them, but after I found this out, 
I just consistently ate avocados even more for that reason. Okay, number two, green leafy vegetables, specifically cruciferous, uh, cruciferous vegetables uh, as well, because green leafy vegetables like kale and arugula are good because they're high in potassium and magnesium. And potassium and magnesium lower stress. If you saw my previous video that I did on magnesium, I tell you that you know, essentially in nature, magnesium is the relaxation uh, mineral. It's the chill pill in nature, okay? Now, I'm not saying go get a supplement. I'm saying to eat these green leafy vegetables to get your magnesium. So that way, if you have a lot of magnesium in your body, it's going to cause your body to relax because magnesium, that's specifically what it does. And 80%, 70 to 80% of the population is actually deficient in it, okay? So that's why it's so important to get these green leafy vegetables in your body because you're going to have an increase of that magnesium, but also the potassium and potassium in particular is really good for actually lowering insulin in the body. And remember what I said about insulin. Insulin is the fat storage hormone in the body. Okay. Number three, this is going to surprise you. Number three is hot water. Okay. Hot water. Hot water is good because it actually increases the temperature of the body, which increases circulation, but it also improves elimination as well, which helps by way of, you know, solving the problem of constipation. Okay. And so what I do every morning when I wake up, the first beverage I try to have is going to be some form of hot tea. And for me, that's usually squeeze some key lime in there and also some slices of ginger root. And ginger root is also good for help helping to maintain a healthy weight as well too so hot water is also really good for helping you burn fat as well too okay increases the temperature of the body okay increases the circulation thereby helping to help with elimination and other things as well too all right so hot water number three number four green juices and green smoothies okay and why because you're getting a high concentration of not only the green things that I talked about before, but any of those other plant-based foods that you add into that green smoothie or green juice is going to not only solve your issue around fiber, which is hugely important when it comes to maintaining a healthy weight, but it's also going to help your issue with deficiencies. Remember what I said, deficiencies are one of the primary reasons why people can't not only stay healthy, but also maintain a healthy weight too. You have to understand for most people who are overweight, they're actually overfed, but also malnourished. What you'll notice is that people who are overweight, they tend to have a lot of deficiencies. It's because the food that they're eating is a lot in abundance and quality, um, quantity, but not an abundance in quality, okay? So when you're having these green juices and green smoothies, you not only get an abundance of nutrients, but you're getting an abundance of nutrients and you're also not having to take in a lot of calories to get that nutrient, okay? Because they're nutrient dense, all right? So number four, green juices and green smoothies. Number five, cayenne pepper and spices. Cayenne pepper in particular. What I noticed when I lived in India and travel uh, to other countries that they use a lot of spicy things now particularly in india what i've learned when i lived in india was that indian spicy is not like any other spicy so when they say do you want it spicy and it's indian food um i usually say i either want no spice <laughs> or very mild okay because indian food the spice level is like here okay and so those spices are really good for our our digestive system, but also good for keeping the body um, heated, that keeping that body temperature up, raising that body temperature, which again, which I was saying earlier, helps with improving circulation. It even cayenne pepper even helps with high blood pressure as well too. All right, so that's one of the therapeutic advantages of cayenne pepper, but it's really important because the thing about cayenne pepper and other spices as well too, they have the capability of firing up your metabolism, increasing your metabolism. And particular when it comes to cayenne pepper, what you'll notice is that that cayenne pepper, it actually has a compound in it known as capsaicin. 
okay? Capsation increases heat, which burns calories, okay? And you'll also see capsation in a lot of the over-the-counter uh, natural remedies for pain as well, too, all right? Again, increasing heat, increasing circulation in the area to actually cause the pain to go away as well, too. So Thanks for watching this video, but be sure to check the next video out that's right here. But everything I talk about is how do we take a holistic and natural approach to healing other than a man-made approach? And also, how do we prevent dis-ease in the body as well, too? Because, you know, they say...